Let us pray. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for your presence with us today. We pray Holy Spirit will fill us with a sense of awe at the miraculous things our Heavenly Father accomplished when he sent Jesus into this world to save us from our sins. Father, show us the opportunities to proclaim your love here in this community. We pray you will move hearts through the Daily Bread Initiative so we will see some new curious people come and see what the Lord has done. May we, your church, be a beacon of light in the darkness. We thank you, Father, for this Queensway Church family, for each one who calls Queensway home and helps this body of Christ in his or her own special way. In our Queensway prayer focus this week, we especially lift up to you Stan and Ruth Ann Krawczyk. Lord, we are so grateful for the contributions they make here at Queensway for your glory. Be near to Stan, Ruth Ann, and their family. Bless them in all that they do and put a hedge of protection around them. And may they know just how much you love them. Father, we also want to lift up to you today Norma, Jesse, and Judy, as they each battle their own health issues. We pray for your healing touch to be upon each one. May they feel your hand of healing working in their bodies, bringing them back to health. And Father, we thank you for each member of the Queensway Board and for their willingness to serve you in this ministry. Today we ask for an extra measure of your wisdom for our annual meeting. We pray that you will continue to pour out your wisdom upon each board member and inspire them boldly with your vision for this, your church, and help us to encourage and support them with this important work. Father, we pray for our Pastor Brian. Give him strength for this journey he is on and pour out your wisdom and spirit upon him in a special way as he encourages us in our spiritual journey. Thank you for his enthusiasm to share your word and help us to know you more. And in our wider Free Methodist Church family, we pray for Bramalee Free Methodist Church in Bramalee, Ontario. We pray, Father, for your direction as they go through this season of transition. Encourage those who are serving in the church during their church search for a new pastor. We pray that you will give wisdom to their PLTF as they do the difficult work of finding a new pastor so they can continue giving their hearts and hands to God's service. And Heavenly Father, as we grow closer to Christmas, help us to remember the real reason for this beautiful season, the birth of our Savior, Jesus. It is easy to get caught up in decorations, parties, and gifts, but without Jesus, it's all in vain. In the precious name of our Lord, amen. Good morning, everyone. Revelation 21, 1 to 14. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immortal, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. 
Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels, and the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. This is the word of God. Thank you in Jesus' name. So today we conclude our journey through the revelation of Jesus Christ, this journey that we've been on for the past 13 weeks. And today we're looking at chapters 21 and 22. And to conclude using this, this analogy that I, that I shared with you early on, the analogy of a roller coaster, um, it's been a heck of a ride, hasn't it? <laughs> How many of you have discovered new things about Revelation and especially about the middle part of Revelation that you maybe hadn't noticed before, skipped over, ignored, pretended it wasn't there? Can I get a witness, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in those, in those middle chapters between the seven letters to the churches and chapter 21 and 22 where we are today. And because we are good news people, we like to focus on the good news, right? And we like, we like the last two chapters of Revelation because they're good news, especially for us who are believers in Christ. But it's been a heck of a ride. But the ride's coming to an end. Where, like, like any roller coaster, the ride is slowing down. And we're entering the place where we began, the station. And the good news is we're victorious because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And that we are on the winning team because we've placed our faith, our trust, our hope in Him alone. And it makes us wonder why anyone would choose eternal separation from God spent in hell. Hell is a, is a physical place, just like heaven is a physical place. That's why when I do the PowerPoints and I try to catch them all, and I don't get them all, but I try to catch them all, I capitalize heaven. Even though our Bibles don't capitalize heaven, I capitalize heaven because heaven is a true place. It's a, it's a physical place. And that's why I capitalize hell as well, because hell is a physical place. It is a place of eternal separation from God. And I don't, I don't understand. We, anybody who is, has any heart for people can't understand why they would choose eternal separation from God rather than accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives and the opportunity of spending eternity in his presence, in his glorious kingdom, which is revealed to us in these concluding chapters. And the reality is, and I've shared this before, but the reality is if we didn't have revelation in our Bibles, we wouldn't know what we had to look forward to. We truly wouldn't. Because there is no other place in Scripture that paints a picture of the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, but Revelation. It's the only place. It's the only place. And why is that? Because Jesus only gave it once. And he only gave it once to the beloved disciple, John who was in exile on Patmos. But what a glorious day that will be, friends. When we're reunited, or not reunited, when we are united with that great crowd of witnesses that we read about in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Listen to what this says. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the champion who imitates, initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. We've seen much in, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we've seen much of his throne room described in various ways and means as we've journeyed through this, this revelation. And we're back here again in these concluding chapters. And the truth is, if it weren't for this revelation from Jesus, this pulling back of the curtain to reveal to us what awaits, we wouldn't have any sense or image of what eternity in his kingdom would be like. But here we get a foretaste. And it is, in glor it is glorious indeed. It is really, it's indescribable. Words cannot adequately express what we are being shown. Only to give God thanks and praise for his inexpressible gift of grace and salvation through his son, Jesus, who was willing to lay his life down for ours, shedding his blood on the cross at Calvary, despising the cross, disregarding its shame, and paying our sin debt in full with his precious blood. Not so that he could boast, but so that we could have new life. He did this for you and for me, so that we could have new life, eternal life, in and through him, now and for eternity. And our only adequate Expression, our only adequate response can be to praise the Lord. To say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! With all our heart can muster. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, as we enter into these final chapters of Revelation, your revelation, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us this day. Lord, a word of encouragement, a word of hope, a word to sustain us and to guide us and uphold us this coming week. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we begin, I want to remind us once again that this, this, um, this revelation is, uh, much of it is symbolic. It's a vision and not literal, and, 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 and that becomes apparent in, in these last chapters. Jesus is giving John a sense of what it will be like when all things are made new. It's akin to, I was thinking, thinking about this, it's akin to an architect's drawing, rendering of a new building. And you've all seen them, whether you bought them or not, you've all seen them. You know, the architect creates this, this beautiful rendering of sometimes a 3D model, sometimes just a picture of, of what this, this space will be transformed into. And it's beautiful, and the parks, and you got the people, and all of this stuff is beautiful, and it's perfect, and it looks lovely. And then they build it. <laughs> and, and very rarely does it ever come out exactly the way the architect envisioned it, right? It's, there's, a, there's, it, there's always some changes because they encounter issues along the way and, say, and they realize 
ah, we thought that was a good idea when we were designing it, but yeah, it's not going to work, so we're going to have to make some alterations and some changes and so on. And so it never ends up looking exactly the way the architect envisioned it in the first place. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, friends. Because that's not the case here. See, the master architect of all creation, almighty God, will finish his creation. But unlike an architect's rendering of what a building is going to look like and it falling short, God's doing it the other way around. He's giving us a peek at what we humans can comprehend this new creation to look like. But here's the good news, friends. It's going to blow our minds because it's going to be far greater, far more beautiful, far more spectacular, far more majestic than we could possibly conjure up in our mind's eye. There isn't even within our brains the ability to form a picture of the beauty and majesty and glory of this new new creation. And we don't have the words to describe it. And we see that in in, in these chapters. But we're given a foretaste. And man, if that foretaste is anything like what the reality will be, Come, Lord Jesus, come, (laughs) right? Take me home right now because I'm looking forward to it. It's pretty spectacular. The first thing I notice in the the first eight verses that, that we heard Roz read this morning is that this is the work of God's hands. This is not the work of our hands. This is God's doing. He is doing this, not us. Look at verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God. Coming down from God. Don't miss that. This is coming down from God. Out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Who hasn't experienced the joy, guys who are married, standing at the front of a church sanctuary and you first glimpse the woman that you are about to marry Step through those doors. I still remember this day, June 12th. No, June. (laughs) June 2012, standing at the front of the church, and Susan stepped through the door, and she was. Absolutely beautiful. And it brought tears to my eyes. I was so overwhelmed in that moment that God had, had loved me so much and blessed me so much that he had given me this woman to have in marriage. And I wept. It's a beautiful image that, that we're being given here in Revelation. This new Jerusalem is coming down from God, from heaven, adorned like a bride for her husband. What what a beautiful image that is. A symbol of Judeo-Christian faith that the holy city of Jerusalem is coming down from God, and this is God's doing. It's not us, it's not being built by our hands. It is a gift for the redeemed of God, 
Verse 5 tells us this. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. It's coming down from heaven, and this is not a rebuilt, refurbished, renovated, repurposed Jerusalem. This is a brand new creation. Remember, John is in exile on the island of Patmos. It's 95 AD. The temple and the holy city in Jerusalem were destroyed by the Romans, demolished again for the umpteenth time in 70 AD. Now, now we're at 95 AD, and, and, and the holy city has been in ruin. God is doing a new thing here. But just like other scenes we've looked at in Revelation, it's pointing us back to the Old Testament. And this time, we're going right back to the very beginning. The very beginning of creation, found in Genesis chapters 1 to 3. And what, be, what God began in the beginning of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, he is bringing to completion in the last chapters of the last book of the Bible. And it is good. It is very good. And so we're living in this in-between this in -between time referred to as the church age, awaiting this final fulfillment of God's glorious plan for his creation. Look at verses three and four. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. God's home is no longer the temple that can only be accessed by the priest of that year to enter the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifices. God is now literally going to dwell among us. And we had a foretaste of that with Jesus. God's one and only Son came and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. I love how the message puts it. And he, he moved into the neighborhood. He, he set up his home on the cul-de-sac. Right? That's how personal this is for God and for us. That God's home is now among his people, among you and I. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying. What a glorious uh, scene that will be. I don't know why people are willing to turn their backs on God. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get where they, they call this a book of hate literature. That they, they don't see God as a loving and compassionate and forgiving and caring God. They turn their backs on him and they refuse his love and his grace and they reject Jesus. I put a clip on uh, by Alistair Begg on our Facebook page this week and, and he, 
He's one of those preachers that has such a profound way of saying things. He says, and I can't do the Irish accent, so I'm not even going to try. He says, don't fall for the idea that somehow or another, there are people out there who desperately want to come to Jesus and God's not willing to allow them. Let me say that again. Don't fall for the idea that somehow or another there are people out there who desperately want to come to Jesus and God's not willing to allow them. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The reason people don't come to Jesus is because they have no desire for Jesus. They have no desire for Jesus. Romans chapter 8, the end of the chapter says, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ, except ourselves. <laughs> We're the only ones who can separate, our, separate ourselves from the love of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Because we don't have the desire in our hearts to come to him, to be one with him. And the sad truth is evident today and in, 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 as it has been in every age. The people have no desire for the one who loves them and desires to have an intimate relationship with them to be their God. And we saw what God is going to do for them, revealed in verses 5 to 7. He says, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from, don't miss that, freely. I will give freely, there's no charge for this. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. What a vision of the Father's love for us. There's no strings attached, friends. There's no strings. He gives freely. For we are his beloved children. Listen to what John wrote in his first letter, chapter 3. You know this verse. See how much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. We have only seen in part, we only know in part, that the time is coming when Jesus will reveal himself for those who have placed their faith and trust in him. But verse eight, 8 reminds us, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. God's word makes the differentiation between the redeemed in Christ and those who refuse his gift of salvation. One is eternal life with Jesus. The other is eternal separation from Jesus in the lake of sulfur and fire, otherwise known as hell. And so then we get this picture of this new heaven and new earth. And I'm just going to read this for you because it wasn't part of the scripture reading. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls 
containing the last, the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come with me, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The city wall, wall was broad and high, with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each, on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who had talked to me held, his hand, held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. When he measured it, he found it was square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. The wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. Anybody ever seen gold as clear as glass? Only God, friends, only God. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, um, carnelian the seventh chrysolite, the eighth uh, beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrys uh, chrysophase, and the eleventh Jacinth and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were made of pearls, each from one from a single pearl. Can you imagine a gate made from a single pearl? How big must that pearl have been? And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. There it is again, this, this gold that's clear. I mean, I got a gold ring on my finger, it ain't clear. You can't see through it, but this gold is as clear as glass. Only God. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry or dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the, of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine, for healing. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no, no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Man, what an incredible picture. 
What a spectacular image of this new creation, this new Jerusalem. And notice in the creation story of Genesis, God created the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all of that, but there's no need for it now in this new creation because God the Father and Jesus the Son are its light. There's no need for a temple to be rebuilt in this new Jerusalem because they are the temple. And there's no evil, no suffering in this new creation. It's beyond human comprehension. And what's even more spectacular is his Shekinah glory is shining forth in this glorious city. The Shekinah glory previously only experienced by Moses up on the mountain when he received the Ten Commandments and the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies once a year to offer sacrifices. That was the only time when, when, when people got to see, to experience the Shekinah glory. But here, in this new creation, it will be our light. And all whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be there. I think of the, of the great anthem of our faith, Handel's Messiah. In the Hallelujah Chorus, which proclaims the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And yes, I cut a bunch of stuff out of that, but anyway, for the sake of time. Finally, we read in verses 7 to 21, the good news, the promise of Jesus coming. He says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down and to worship at the feet of the angel. Here he goes again. He didn't learn the first time. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Then he instructed me, don't, do not seal up the prophet, prophetic words in this book. For the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love, who love, uh, who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches i am both the source of, of david and the heir to his throne i am the bright morning star the spirit and the bride say come let anyone who hears this say come let anyone who is thirsty come let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life and I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophe prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to the person, to that person, the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove 
that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. He who is faithful, uh, he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Lord, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. These last few verses remind us that Jesus is coming. He says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book, reminding us of what Jesus told us at the very beginning of his revelation. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. We are like John, friends. And the seven churches revealed in chapters 2 and 3, two and three were still waiting Jesus' return, waiting his promised fulfillment of all these things which must take place. The eradication of evil once for all, the end to pain and suffering and death. But we wait patiently and we give God thanks and praise for the time he has given us to sow seeds of the gospel, to testify to the saving grace of Jesus, to show the love and compassion, grace and mercy of Christ to a hurting and broken and lost world, to be his light in the darkness, to share the reason for the hope that we have to a world that is searching for hope and meaning and purpose in the things of this world. To share Jesus. That's ultimately why we exist as a church. To know Jesus more intimately and to make him known to our community and beyond. I began by quoting the last three verses of chapter 12 of Hebrews, chapter 12 of Hebrews. But those verses conclude what is being written about in chapter 11, what is referred to as the Hall of Faith, a methodical portrayal of God's servants who walked by faith in the one true God, and that chapter begins with this verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The truth is, friends, we see dimly and know only in part, for God has only given us a foretaste of what is to come. But Jesus has only pulled back the corner of the curtain to reveal God's ultimate plan to restore his creation. And Jesus tells us in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 29, this is that that great scene with Thomas, and he says, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Friends, we have returned to the beginning as we have concluded this this revelation of Jesus Christ. The God who desired to walk with us in the garden in the cool of the evening, to talk with us and to be our God and we his people, his beloved children, is the same God who seeks that kind of relationship with us today. And, in the, and the day is surely coming because he has promised and he is faithful and true to his word when he will return and make all things new. Jesus is indeed coming. Though we don't know the day or the time, we await with eager anticipation by faith and with expectant hope. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word which challenges us, convicts us, rebukes us, and encourages us for our journey. We want to walk in step with your spirit. We want to live according to your will. And we are ready, Lord, when you return. You will find us waiting expectantly. You will find us eagerly anticipating your return, just as the 
our, our forebears did. And Lord, we trust that you will come soon. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we thank you that you have claimed us as your own. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.